In 1977, Dave started his 24 years of service by enlisting in the Air Force at the Air Force Recruitment Station. Dave was 18, Jimmy Carter was president, gas was 65 cents a gallon, and disco was king. I'm here to serve America, sir. Okay, so all we need now from you is your signature. This is what I was born to do. Dave served eight years as a hospital room technician, which actually meant he was doing the surgery, making the first incisions, prepping for the doctor who would come in afterwards. Almost done with that, Dave. Yes, Doc. I finally found the bullet, and I'm taking it out as we speak. My beeper hasn't stopped beeping. The OSI Office of Special Investigations was the best of the best, the elite of the elite. They were comprised of people who were the top 1% from each career field. Dave, congratulations. You've been picked to join the OSI. You're going to Norton Air Force Base. Soon you'll be going to Korea. We need you to hunt down some spies endangering our operation there. As our newest spy hunter, We'll need you to get them off our back. Having the highest government clearance, the OSI is the most feared of groups. Unlike the CIA, the OSI has both investigative and arrest authority anywhere in the world, giving the bad guys nowhere to hide. They wear Air Force uniforms with no insignias and usually are wearing a coat and tie. I'm honored. Thank you, sir. Mission accomplished. Another one bites of dust. Many of our aircraft had classified equipment needing maintenance inside South Korean airline hangars. North Korea was also infiltrating the South Korean military to steal technology. There were Russian and Chinese trawlers all over the South Korean ports looking to steal our high-tech stuff. Dave's job was to neutralize the Russian and Chinese spies. Dave was, to say the least, very successful becoming, for two years in a row, the highest decorated OSI agent for neutralizing Russian and Chinese spies. Now, we're going to focus on North Korean spies. General, it's been my privilege and honor to serve. After 12 years with the OSI and 20 years total with the military, Dave retired from the service, declining the OSI's invitation to remain and take on additional responsibilities. So in 1999, David began working for the Indianapolis 500 racing team, target Chip Ganassi as protective service for celebrity driver Juan Montoya. Dave never left his side and they dined together regularly. Dave strapped him in and out of every race, including the Indy 500 victory in 2000. Congrats, Juan. You just won the Indy 500. Dave's job was to protect Montoya, and there were a few places Montoya went without him. Dave and his wife had the good life touring with the celebrity, but Dave was still worrying about the trawlers with the thousand antennas and was never really comfortable with the jet set. Kirtland had the highest technology, Star Wars, weapons of mass destruction, Kind of like an Area 51 desert base with everything buried 200 feet underground. Honey, you have a phone call. Dave, go to a top secret phone. Look, things are really heating up and we'll need you back as a civilian federal agent. You're going to Kirkland Air Force Base. Juan, you are the fastest man on Earth. Woohoo! Dave, you'll bring me love! <laughs> but Dave still had some unfinished business. Oh, well, it was nice while it lasted, but duty called. So the next day, Dave finished a race in Chicago, changed into jeans, and boarded a plane to Albuquerque. It feels like I've been here before.
On 9-11, immediately after the attack, headquarters at OSI phoned Dave and asked him to go to the U.S. State Department Foreign Service Institute for intensive 24-7 one-year immersion into Islamic language and culture. What in the hell? Dave, we need you to go to that high-intensive Islamic immersion course, ASAP. Twelve months later, Dave, we were going to send you to Gitmo, but we decided we need you to do some spy hunting. Now, the war in Iraq won't start for another three months. The Saudis are giving Saddam Hussein our capabilities, intel, putting our boys in danger. You'll be based in Saudi Arabia, infiltrating Iraq. As for the spies, we need you to well neutralize them. Now, that's the good news. The OSI weren't the only ones who would be warning Dave. Saudi military police wearing green uniforms, not Arabic, also warned Dave he could be executed if he was caught where he shouldn't be. Mr. Govitz, you better not be caught sneaking into Iraq. We don't want you meddling in Saudi business. You would be considered a spy, and that would have dire consequences. Oh, thanks for the advice. Who in the hell does this guy think he is? The Saudis didn't want Dave sharing the secret about how they were leaking intel about U.S. capabilities. Before David's deployment to Iraq, the Saudi officers who gave Hussein the intel were neutralized. Regardless, every night Dave and four to six other agents would cut fences and drive 30 miles deep into Iraqi territory searching for spies and intel concerning the vulnerability of their ARAR base in Saudi Arabia. They'll be sorry if I catch them. What do you see? Looks like the coast is clear. It's go time. Dave's group conducted field interviews looking to collect intel that would protect our troops and our resources. So, have you seen any evidence of chemical WMD? Is there WMD here in Iraq? Are you kidding? Why else would the villagers be sealing their poorest homes from vapors? The Bedouins are harmless Arab nomads with no borders. As the war grew closer, the camp grew with Iraqi spies dressed as Bedouin, who were moving in to be close to the base to collect intel. Dave was friendly with the Bedouins, so it was natural for Dave to talk with them and find out what they knew. The Bedouin knew they were different, wearing battle dress with no rank, no insignia, Iraqis were sealing their doors and windows, convinced they were in danger from chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Dave was now officially going to Iraq to Nasiriyah. Dave, okay, war's officially on, so you won't have to sneak in anymore. Redeploy to Iraq tomorrow. Before Dave's deployment to Iraq, the Saudi officers who gave Hussein the intel had been neutralized. Once there, Dave slept on top of cars or in foxholes and was given four liters of water per day for all purposes. This is no diplomat, but it sure beats getting my head shot off. Our boys lived in their foxholes in the desert. The next day. Dave, first thing we need to do is rescue our prisoners. Jessica Lynch is a priority cause America is sick over what those bastards might do to her. We're gonna need your help with intel if we're going to get this done. The 507th Maintenance Company had been ambushed. Several of the 507th were killed while the rest were captured along with Jessica Lynch. Oh we had the God. intel that she was in Saddam Hospital and her room overlooked the soccer field. The Fedayeen lined up some of her fellow soldiers of the 507th on the goal line at the soccer field, just outside her window. Okay, which one do I start with? From her window, 
Jessica was forced to watch these poor souls tortured, executed, and some beheaded. Make it quick, you bastard. Out of respect to the brave men of the 507th Maintenance Company, we will not depict this. The poor girl is here, and the setting you plan to take her away tomorrow and bury her alive. The primary doctor for Jessica Lynch, Dr. Hamid, in the hospital, told her brother-in-law, attorney Mohammed al-Rahif, about Jessica. Attorney Mohammed al-Rahif and his brother Hassan, an Iraqi police officer, went to the Marines to tell them of Jessica's plight. Al-Rahif and his brother Hassan gave the life-saving logistics information to the U.S. Marines, who took action, and not a moment too soon. You see, the Fedayeen planned to smuggle Jessica Lynch into a Red Crescent ambulance, tying Jessica under the bed with another on top. Then they were going to take her to the desert and bury the ambulance with Jessica inside, alive. This Iraqi smuggling tactic was routine and is how they moved weapons, Hussein, or anyone else. After all, the rules of engagement on our soldiers did not allow them to stop Red Crescent ambulances or enter mosques, schools, and even hospitals. Let's do this. God help us. Okay, on the count of three. We better hurry before we're spotted. All right, soldiers, you have ten minutes for search and rescue. The Marines stormed the hospital but met no resistance go, as the Fed had go, already go, fled. Go, 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 go. Let's spread out. Eric, come with me. Let's go. Can you see anything? Please, God, help me. The Marines found Jessica in her room and rushed her to the base hospital for medical treatment. Don't worry, Jessica. You can relax now. The base hospital at the time was nothing more than a foxhole. Dave was asked to find the bodies and started uncovering the soccer field and finding bodies and heads. The bodies were buried under the goal line so that the kids would run over them as further disrespect, as if that would be possible. Thank you for your service. I promise you I will not rest until we find the people who did this. God, please help the family members they left behind. Dave was also awarded another medal for his work on the soccer field. Dave also salutes Jessica Lynch, whose patriotism put her in harm's way, facing unimaginable evil. Thank you for your service, Jessica. I salute you. Dave's new urgent mission was now to find and rescue Rahif's nine family members, on the run and in hiding. At 5 a.m., Dave and a half dozen OSI agents and two Humvees found the home where the nine family members were hiding. Go, go, go! Fire teams of two were deployed to each intersection in the alley to watch the side streets. We have to hurry. We've got six minutes to go in, grab them, and get into the getaway car and go. He's heavier than I thought. Dave had to carry Al Rahif's 76 year old father from the bed into the vehicle. Several days later, Saddam loyalists burnt the family house. Dave was looking for and finding just about anything. Oh my God. I hope that Americans never have to understand the suffering that went on in here. Inspecting mosques.
occasionally Dave would find things he wasn't looking for. Dave would find more shames of inhumanity, Hussein's mass graves of his own people. As Dave and agents return to camp, they come under attack. They were now also fighting the Fedayeen Saddam, or Saddam's men of sacrifice, a notoriously violent paramilitary group for Saddam's regime in Baghdad. Another day at the office, another day, another night. Dave was always on the lookout for Islamist terrorists, weapons, and anything suspicious. Salam Malikum, most merciful terrorist. He'd greet them in Arabic, which stunned and disarmed the occupants just long enough for them to be cuffed. If weapons were found, they took the detainees to enemy POW camps and interrogated them. Dave won an award during war as the number one OSI collector of intel and interrogations. <laughs> 